Hi, and welcome to Think Corner. This is the first of three discussions in the Collegium Talks series with the theme, Thinking Future Worlds. Uh, on April 15th, in two weeks, our colleagues Heiki Patomeki and Magnus Reiner will be talking on the team, Is Another Europe Possible After All? Reflections on the European Green Deal and the COVID Recovery Plan. And two weeks after, on April 29th, uh, our colleagues Airi Alina Alaste and Kinga Polinchuk Alenius will speak on social media and politics of the future, complicating scenarios for a complex world. Uh, but today I'm here with Xin Liu, and uh, our topic is From the Anthropocene to Bat Soups Thinking Extinction, Our Own, and That of Others. Um, just a reminder that audience members can ask questions on the Facebook page for the event. And our moderator, Kaisa Kakinen, will read your questions to us once we are done with the discussion. So this will be at the end of our discussion. And I'll remind you again at that point um, to direct your questions to um, the Facebook page, the, the chat box. So thinking our extinction and that of others. When we first thought about this topic for today's discussion, um, Shin and I started talking about the multiple crises we're facing. Um, it is a time of many crises um, and these crises are intertwined. Um, it's difficult to disentangle them. There's of course the environmental crisis the Anthropocene, the sixth mass extinction, um, the social crisis, the rise of populism, racism, polarization of citizens, citizens and, and uh, politics. Um, there's of course the medical crisis, um, the pandemic that we're living through and that forces us in all kinds of weird circumstances. And there's, of course, the economic crisis that has been unfolding for a long time, as, as have all these crises. They're not new. Um, and the economic crisis of uh, worsening inequities, inequities that have been exacerbated by um, the current pandemic and, and, of course, the environmental um, situation. Um, but when we were talking about that, um, Shin mentioned a concept, the concept of Wei Ji, um, which I thought was really interesting. Do you want to say a, a few words about what Wei Ji is and what it means? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Wei Ji is the um, Chinese uh, translation of crisis or what crisis is in Chinese. Uh, Wei is danger, um, threats, and G is opportunity. So in a sense that I think it, it um, underscores a sense of contingency, but also rupture. So in a sense that what we consider as, you know, the confines of what is normal and what is the taken for granted is opened up and invites new considerations of the status quo. So, um, so Wei Ji, I think in that way, um, compared to crisis, perhaps uh, helps us to think about um, questions of contingency and rupture in a more um, vivid sense. Okay, and, and so really it, it's a way to think of crisis not only in the negative, right? Um, if I'm understanding this correctly. And, and so I, I think that's interesting because um, if we're thinking about the crises I mentioned as modes of extinction, and we'll, we'll come to the concept of extinction, but um, if, we're, if we think about them as modes of extinction, modes through which certain things come to an end, they come to an end, but they, that coming to an end might open up new beginnings. And so um, extinction is, is not all that bad um, in, in that sense. And, and crisis can be generative, is what we can gather from this concept. Okay, great, great. Um, so 
our focus today, as you gathered from the title of our discussion, is um, the environmental crisis. So this is what um, we wanted to discuss. We both research in this area. We, uh, we think a lot about a lot of the concepts we will be discussing today. And um, we wanted to have a discussion um, on these very important contemporary issues. And so I'm just gonna get started. We do live in the Anthropocene. Um, this notion has been accepted. Um, it's being currently defined. So what does it mean? It's become a, a household term. A lot of people uh, have heard about the Anthropocene. They've seen the term around. They might have gone to exhibits that were about the Anthropocene. But how do we define it? I mean, there's a geological approach to the Anthropocene, but there's also a cultural understanding of what the Anthropocene is about. Um, Shin, do you want to get us started on this? Um, right, yeah. So basically, uh, I think this is also really interesting because uh, I remember just like a couple of years ago, I... I I first time heard like the notion of Anthropocene and or Anthropocene and people are saying like in conferences, I remember uh, people are like, is that Anthropocene or is that Anthropocene? Like people are kind of trying to figure out how to pronounce it. But now it's, you know, it's almost like you said, household name is everywhere. It's um, talked about in such a mainstream level. Um, but I think what's really interesting about this notion and coming from the geological term is that it really also gave rise to sense of interdisciplinary discussions between the culture studies, humanities, and uh, geological science. So I think from the culture studies or humanities point of view, the Anthropocene has often been considered as basically uh, looking at an epoch um, that is generated or you know, a certain transformation of the earth as we know it has been done by you know, what is considered as a species act. I mean, that in itself has a lot of different problems because for one thing that it flattens out the differences amongst, you know, the what is considered as human um, and uh, also flattens out the different ways in which we contribute to this transformation uh, from different um, aspects. So I think that sense of an undifferentiated human we, the anthropos, is something that I think from the culture studies or the humanities point of view is something that needs to be challenged, even though the concept itself is very generative in the sense that it enables um, interdisciplinary discussions about the epoch that we live in and the kind of environmental conditions that we are living through. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, um, but I think we need to take a step back. Um, if I'm, if this is my first confrontation with the term, or, or if I'm you at that conference many years back, and that was me too at some point, it's like Anthropocene, Anthropocene, scene, okay, Anthropos. So we're talking about the epoch of the human. Um, so what, what are we trying to say here? And um, the, the, the earth scientists and chemists that, that came up with this term, um, initially, what, the, the intention was to really um, indicate that the human race, the anthropos, um, had caused, um, uh, uh, the, the, the human activity has, has been damaging to such an extent that the human species has left uh, an, an indelible trace um, on the earth. It has impacted the earth in a way that we cannot reverse. And so we have entered the epoch of the human, i.e. the epoch caused by the human. And for geologists, of course, this is a, this is a matter of describing an epoch, of defining it, of, of finding um, a layer some a trace in the sediment layers that indicates the start of a new epoch. One interesting difficulty that they're facing that, that um, I believe it was Zalaziewicz who explained, it's difficult because we are in it. It's different to try to define the Anthropocene from a geological perspective. Um, it's more difficult to do so than to define the Pleistocene or any other past epochs because we are in the midst of it. And also, depending on where you place the start of it, 
um, you may not have a, 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 a layer of sediment in the rocks um, that has formed yet. So how do you insert a plaque somewhere to say this is where it started, which is what has been done with previous epochs. So it's an interesting challenge for, um, for geologists. Um, and um, actually, I was telling you about this colleague of mine um, who works at uh, Lake Crawford in Ontario. And what they are doing is they're drilling at the bottom of the lake to get those sediments, sediment cores. So they, they drill out cores and then they look at the various layers that have sedimented at the bottom of the lake. The lake has a chemistry that is very favorable for doing this kind of research. And that lake is one of the candidates for placing the marker for the start of the Anthropocene because she's able to dig out these very clear cores of um, sedimentation. Um, and uh, of course, I'm not an earth scientist, so I'm not talking about this, right? Um, I'm sure I, I could get a lot of criticism, but that's what I understand from what she explains to me. Um, so that's the work of earth scientists, but cultural theorists um, deal with the epoch in a different way. And you started alluding to this. And I want to hear your, your, your thoughts on this. Dale Jameson um, said about the Anthropocene, he said the following, he said, what makes the Anthropocene a moment of crisis, which it is not for geologists, right? That's a matter of defining um, her history. So he says, what makes the Anthropocene a, mo a moment of crisis is the recognition of humanity's collective power that is oddly and perhaps paradoxically matched with a widespread feeling of powerlessness. I find this quote very evocative, um, but what are your thoughts on this, Shin? Um, well, I was actually reading today the book, um, The Shock of the Anthropocene, Anthropocene. <laughs> and uh, very similarly, uh, they also asked, like, so now we realize, you know, the world or Earth as we know it is in our hands. How do we react to that? And on the, on the one hand, there is the feeling of a sense of um, powerlessness. Like, what are we going to do about this? You know, this is the irreversible change we've done. Like, what are we going to do? On the other hand, it's a sense of exuberance of powerfulness uh, in the sense that, you know, the, the proposition of good Anthropocene. Like, okay, now we see that we've done damage, but hey, look, we can actually design Earth in the sense that we can, you know, continue our economic development and we can bring all the infrastructures. We can continue to drive profit without any cost. Um, so I think this is also very interesting because um, it relates back to the sense of um, crisis that we talked about. So it, what is really interesting is that I think like typically when we consider a crisis, like, you know, most like everyday sense is often like, okay, we have this something that's kind of ongoing and everything, you know, like as if before COVID, like all of our life is like going day by day and nothing changes. And then suddenly we have this rupture moment and things just go, you know, we don't recognize the routines anymore and we are stuck. But I think the crisis uh, using Weiji, but also like we talked about this at uh, some point, is sense of that it's actually unfolding. It's not, it's not something that suddenly comes, but I think what Weiji as a term, and also thinking about crisis through that as a threat and productivity contingency, is also to think about the system as we know it, you know, the economy, um, the, the current like social political system that we live in, is not in itself an intact entity that suddenly gets some kind of disruption and then, you know, we are thrown into disorder, but that, the very maintenance of the system itself is always really contingent and it requires repetitive labor. So I now don't remember why I started talking about this, but I think the sense that I'm trying to get at um, is that thinking about um, the Anthropocene and thinking about it as, you know, like an idiom that is now picked up um, very widely, uh, I'm also very um, cautious of the sense that it does reproduce a very... Um, undifferentiated sense of we as the humanity. 
um, and that it might be light and actually even justify certain political and non decisions that contribute to global inequalities for the sake of us need to survive, you know, in this world. Um, so I think that's what I'm getting at. Right. Um, yeah, no, and, and I, I think those are all really good points. I, I, and what you bring up about, you know, like this incredible feeling of power and powerlessness, right? The concept of the Anthropocene um, really shocks the imagination. I, I like how they translated Bonneuil and Fresseau's um, title, um, because in French it's l'événement anthropocène, so something that happens, the event. But the shock of the Anthropocene, this is really what it is. It should be shocking that we have um, exercised our techno science in a way um, that has been so detrimental to the herd system, right? And, and so if we come to that realization, then this is a moment where we need to take stock. But I think, yeah, and you were pointing to that um, in the last few things you said there, like to say the humanity, that humanity is responsible. Is that true? And that's something that Bonnet and Fresseau also bring up in their book very importantly to say, OK, we call this the Anthropocene as if every single member of the human species was responsible um, for the state of affairs. However, um, this is far from the case. Um, and um, what I keep thinking about in relation to that, and they make a really good case um, for that, um, to say that it's really a small group of humans. And depending on how you look at it, you could say it was really white middle class men that drove this progress and industrial revolution um, and development and, and, and economic development and whatnot. Or maybe it was the war machine, the Tanatocene, we should call it the Tanatocene instead. Or maybe it's capital that's driving all this. And so we should call it really the capitalocene, right? Um, but really what the, the thing that keeps coming to mind for me is that it, it, it's now generally accepted that the marker, so the start of the Anthropocene is in the early 1950s, um, with the nuclear fallout uh, from nuclear testing. And the reason that has been chosen rather than plastic or pollution or raising CO2 is that you can measure uh, globally, um, you, can, you can see uh, the global synchronicity of that um, nuclear fallout. You, you see traces over the, the whole planet. Um, of, of that event. And so it's possible to measure it and therefore to identify it um, in the sediments. And, and, but if you think about this, who was behind nuclear testing? Um, certainly not the whole of humanity. And in fact, many humans would have been opposed <laughs> to nuclear testing. So, so the marker itself, I think, points to the fact that the Anthropocene, that, that, that the term might be a misnomer in the end. I, I don't know what you think about all this. Yeah, and I also think that I was also thinking about annotating, like as you were talking, annotating and Donna Harris' conversation about this. And one thing uh, that Harry points out, which I thought was actually very important, is that this concept itself um, is generated in, you know, the Northern Hemisphere in certain institutional um, and academic settings. Um, but whether it's translatable to local experiences of, you know, you know how the environment is transformed, uh, is being transformed, and whether it can be relatable to people um, that do not experience Anthropocene in the sense of geological sense. And, and why there is a power of naming <laughs> and why as we are picking up the term itself, we are also reinforcing a certain um, exceptionalism in the sense of who can point out, uh, who can you know, provide this marker of, of a geological epoch. So what Harvey was trying to say like, is that there is the politics of and power of naming, but on the other hand, I think that's something that we are both very interested in as well is whether there are um, possibilities to come up with 
terms or analytical perspectives that is more located in a specific context rather than the kind of a universal, you know, catch it all idiom that is supposedly describing the phenomena of, you know, the epoch. So that's, I, I find that very, very interesting. And I think that thinking about like, for example, in, in Finnish, if I understood correctly, like even rain has like all these different names because it captures the experience of specifically how, you know, our body is experiencing the rain. And I, I heard uh, our colleague Jana was telling me about the horizontal um, wind or horizontal snow. So I think that's like very, very interesting. It's also like local embodied experience of the weather. Um, and I think Anthropocene is in that sense, a very kind of, you know, universal catch it all name that tries to describe the current um, ecological crisis. Um, yeah, and I think it might make sense from a geological perspective, from a nerd science perspective, to, to say, okay, this is the epoch of the human, but how humans themselves experience it and how it relates to their own local experiences is very important. And when you say, when you mention, you know, what's in a name, what, what's involved with naming something, I mean, I, I think it's our way, but also other feminist um, thinkers, contemporary thinkers, who have pointed out that, in fact, calling the Anthropocene, calling this new epoch the Anthropocene, the epoch of the human, might be actually counterproductive because it's it's a it's a hubristic move. It's it's putting us in the center yet again, which they think has been the problem and has been the driver of this uh, anthropogenic change that has led us to the the current environmental crisis. So there's that part of it too, right? So taking, keeping, uh, taking and keeping a critical stance toward the term, I think is, is really important um, because we need, as you say, um, also to, to recognize the different experiences that different humans in different circumstances are having in this epoch. The, another thing I, I, I was thinking about is the idea um, Okay, so, so it is a problematic term for the reasons we've mentioned, um, but it's still very useful. So we, we need to keep that critical stance, but, um, but still use the term um, to draw the attention to our attention to the fact that we, we or some humans or many humans have brought us to this point. We can't go back. So the idea is not to say, hey, we need to reverse this because that is not possible. But it's a moment where we can actually acknowledge the power of our action and, and maybe try to rethink um, how we live in the world and how we live with other beings in the world, not just other humans but natural beings and, and the earth system as a whole. So um, recognizing the impact of our action might lead us to, or hopefully it will lead us to um, rethinking um, these relations. And, and some of those thinkers we both work with, so Haraway, for example, um, but also others will, will use the term response ability, right? Um, we have the ability to respond, and the response should be to rethink um, our way of, of, of um, existing in this world, right? Um, so yeah, and, and when we were discussing uh, uh, all of this, we, um, we thought, okay, so but how, how does that play out if, if we do come to that realization? And we think, okay, we need to rethink this. We need to do things better, knowing that we can't go back, but we still need to do things better going forward. Um, we were thinking about um, the, the, the environmental discourse that is very current, right? And the, and the kind of terms and concepts that, that get to be used um, all the time that have also become household terms, right? Um, like that of sustainability. Sustainability is everywhere, right? Um, and and Shin, when we were discussing this, you brought up the WCED definition um, of sustainability, which is really what informs public discourse and public decision making um, on the matter, right? So you want to talk to us about this? 
Right, yeah. So uh, I actually had to take the notes of that because I want to get my facts straight. <laughs> um, but basically, it's defined, it was um, a definition provided by the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987. And it's defined as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So there is this intergenerational aspect, um, it's future oriented. But at the same time, actually, what's at the core of this concept, because um, one thing about sustainable is all, always coupled with development. So ultimately, it's about economic development. And I think what was really interesting, again, in the Shock of Anthropocene book, uh, was that this concept of sustainable development was actually uh, influenced by the um, uh, fishery science that understood sustainability in terms of maximizing um, yield, like, like maximizing yield with the least, like minimizing the, the negative impact. So I thought that was really interesting. And actually last night I was reading a Financial Times article uh, where they were talking about circular economy. Uh, and they, in that article, they were distinguishing uh, circular economy, which become, I think, um, quite pronounced and popular term in the late 2000s. Um, uh, in contrast to sustainability, because they say that sustainability is still like a linear a idea of a linear pro process, linear development. So, you know, the future is in the linear future. Uh, so that versus circular um, economy, the idea is, according to this article and many other uh, discussions related to that, is the idea of keeping every single thing in the system. So nothing goes out of the system. While sustainability might be minimizing waste, um, uh, circular economy is understood as generating even uh, something beneficial and profit from the waste. So everything will be recyclable and everything was already in the system through uh, product design, for example. So I think that's also like really interesting that even you know, in kind of public discussions about what considers sustainable, there's constantly something that is changing and something that is informing how we understand what is considered as sustainable, what is considered as long-term, and how do we understand cost and efficiency. But that seems to me, okay, so am I understanding this right? Because um, it, it, it still rides on, on the idea of the human right to consume, right? Like, there, is there a different, um, a different take on consumption? Uh, whether one takes the sustainability route, as you say, a linear future oriented route or a circular economy route. Seems to me like consumption is, is happening in, in both. So I, I don't understand here. Yeah, it's, um, I think the, old, like I said, the ultimate goal is to keep the economic development all the while as we make sure that, you know, we are not um, destroying nature more than we have already done. So it's in a way of, um, in conservation studies, the accumulation through conservation rather than accumulation through, you know, uh, disposition or appropriation and so on. But I think ultimately that economic incentive is um, a very important uh, factor in how, nature or how our relation with nature is understood. Um, and I think that's also why, you know, feminist scholars um, or feminist materialist scholars have been challenging the idea of, for example, the concept of um, ecosystem service, because the idea is that, okay, now, you know, now we are, we understood our impact or our embeddedness in this world, or we are all of nature. But great, then what can we do? We can then, you know, absorb everything into the economic system uh, and into the market economy because in this line of thinking, the failure of protecting the environment or the ecological crisis is ultimately a market failure. So what do we do about it? We make better market instruments and we financialize, you know, we turn the ecological crisis into a market opportunity. So I think these are really like interesting uh, movements that yes, our understanding of nature is shifting, but I think still there's a very strong incentive of understanding consumption and growth. I think that it ultimately that also enforces you know, a certain relation with nature that is still very much um, appropriating and 
Yeah. Right. And, and, and especially, I mean, the term itself, ecosystem services, I, I'm glad you brought it up because, that, I mean, to me, that seems like a very problematic way of conceptualizing nature as, as, um, as a resource, like providing services to, of course, the human, right? Um, so it, it seems to me that um, this is all oriented toward the human and sustaining the human, right? When we say sustainability, I always ask, well, sustainability for whom? Um, you know, what's sustainable for me, what, what, what allows me to continue to consume and, and grow and, and grow my economy or whatnot and, and increase my financial gain, um, what's sustainable for me may very well not be and in fact often is not uh, sustainable for non-humans, right, or, or even ecosystems and, and, and the earth system as a whole. So the notion of services to me um, you know, like to call it that is, is just reinforcing this human centric um, perspective to our relation to, um, to nature. Um, and, and, and then again, the, the, uh, another concept, um, and we haven't talked much about that, but w- which is also very important um, in this whole um, environmental discourse, um, in public discourse, anyways, is the notion of planetary boundaries. Right. Um, so the idea that, and, and you often see like pie charts <laughs> um, that that talk about these planetary boundaries and whether we've exceeded some and whether we're still okay with others, and and this idea that we can measure what the planet has to offer to us. So again, providing services to us to our um, consumption and growth. Um, and and that we just need to figure out what those are. And then once we do, then we can figure out techno fixes to to sustain our growth and consumption instead of rethinking um, the the, the principles that that drive all this, right? So so it doesn't seem to me like we, um, that that we are doing a good job um, of, of thinking of these systems that are available to us, right? Um, but you, you had a, you had a story that you told me about um, about a plane and rivets, and um, you know that that serves to illustrate this kind of thinking. So you, you want to tell us about it? Yeah, because I thought that was really interesting. Uh, it was uh, from the book by Paul and Anne Ehrlich in two, 1981. It's a book on extinction. And so basically, uh, they invited the readers to imagine or to kind of um, envision the scene that was happening. So the author said, they, um, you approach um, a plane and you see this, this man who is busy um, prying the rivets uh, from the wings. And so you get curious and then you slowly go over there and you ask like, you know, what are you doing? What are you, what are you busy with? And this person says, okay, I'm just, you know, taking off some of the rivets because I can sell them for $2 a piece. And then, um, then you, you, you go like, are you, are you sure it's, it's safe? Because, you know, we're going to be in the air and I don't want to, you know, the wing go like unstable. And this person said, no, don't worry. I've done this for a very long time. And, um, you know, uh, like I work for this airline called uh, Growth Mania uh, Continental, which I love this name. Uh, and, uh, you know, don't worry, we we don't know like which rivet is going to be problematic. So I, I've been doing this for a long time. It's going to be OK. So this story, which now I uh, said it's probably not as the way the book was presenting, but basically the idea is that and I, I thought that was really interesting because it 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 was showing that there is a change in understanding nature from you know nature in terms of resource so we can think about nature as providing you know uh, coal or water and different resources or wood to nature in terms of um, an ecosystem so a system thinking or ecological thinking because what the story is saying that all the rivets we can consider them as species we don't know which species would, you know, provide this, you know, or work together, provide the service that's the service that we would need. Uh, and we don't know how many of them we need. So because of these uncertainties and unknowableness about ecosystems, so we better conserve all of them. 
and rather than picking, you know, which ones are essential species and which are the ad hoc ones. And I thought that was like a very interesting story because it was also, um, I think the beginning of this, you know, transition from nature to, as resource to nature as ecosystem services. Um, mm. Yeah. And so, yeah, so if, if you don't know which rivet on that plane's wing is essential, you better not mess around and just pull them out in case you pulled the wrong one out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's inter that's an interesting story indeed. And, and, and what, what this discussion to me anyways, and, you know, all the readings I've been doing about this and, and listening to people talk. I, I always question, like, the, the, I'm not saying there are not interesting ideas thrown around in terms of, you know, like trying to achieve sustainable, sustainable development. Um, some people are quite creative and inventive. And, and um, yes, we do have um, the, 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 the power to design technology and science that can help us in this way. But um, it always seems to me that um, we're too techno-scientific. Um, we're, we're too optimistic about that power um, and that it, 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 might, it, it might be better to actually question what it is that drives us to relate to non-human others, natural others, in the way we do. Um, and as you say, a pro, a, a adopting an, a, a system thinking approach um, would be um, might be more generative, right? But one thing that come, that is clear to me is that we, we do need new ways of thinking the future. And, and sometimes some fictional um, depictions of what the future might be for us um, can be quite um, evocative, maybe provocative. And um, you, you showed me something, um, that um, that was certainly that evocative and provocative, um, and it's about the people of smog. Um, so, Shin, you want to tell us about this? Yeah, uh, sure. If we could see the image, it would be great. Uh, is, that's not a selfie, is it? <laughs> Yeah, it's the selfie of the people smog. So this was a, a kite, a paper kite uh, I made with, um, so I was, okay, this is a long story. I'm gonna cut it short. Um, we were at this uh, Bio Art Society's event uh, or re um, art residency in 2019. So there were artists, social scientists, uh, humanist scholars and um, scientists. We were all together and the idea was to think about air or the atmosphere. And my group was about, um, you know, I presented this, um, uh, a video uh, called uh, Nose Hair, which was an advertisement or ad campaign by the Wild, Wild Aid uh, in, in Shanghai. And I, I wrote a piece about it and I thought this was a really interesting idea about nose hair. And then for the group project, we decided that I'm not the, uh, I, I'm terrible with, you know, hand, like handicraft stuff, but um, the artist in my group proposed the idea of making kites. Uh, so all of us uh, in the residency made a lot of kites and we were trying to like fly in the, you know, with it. Anyway, so this is one of them. And as you can see, what is very prominent in this feature <laughs> is the nose hair. And so this was taking inspiration from that ad campaign. And I can like say a few words about this. So basically, if you, again, um, imagine with me um, that uh, watching this, because now we can't really watch it. But if you imagine with me that we are watching this ad campaign and from the start, there's a line says, um, Darwin once said that we must adapt to survive. Uh, look, here they are, the victors of pollution age. So then you follow the protagonist. So you see through his eyes, uh, through the protagonist's eyes, um, the image of the apocalyptic China, which is like, you know, in smog and very gray. And um, people started, like you start seeing people wearing, uh, having very long nose hair that are styled in different ways. Some are colored and some, you know, like a super, fancy with different kind of accessories and so on. So it's a very interesting uh, view you can see, but you cannot see the, the protagonist um, face. You can just see through his vision uh, or his perspective, what looks like. And what was really interesting is that as you go on with the video, you start noticing like, oh, hold on. The protagonist is actually very much discriminated because you see, you know, kids from his school laugh at him and you see the, 
people walking by him just look at him like weird like who's this person or you know what's wrong with him and then you see when he gets on the tram or the metro people are just like trying to distance uh, from him and or you know they are trying to take a picture of him as if he's some kind of spectacle like you need to take a picture of what is happening here and even a dog with very long nose hair start barking at him and that was so interesting um anyway so you'd be like what's wrong with this person uh and then slowly um we see he there's like this very nice setting at the fancy restaurant and he presented, you know, we see a hand that presented a very nicely wrapped uh, present, uh, pushing to a date, I assume. And um, the state looked at it and then like, you know, she's eating and dressed nicely and very beautiful. And then, you know, then she, instead of using her hand, her nose hair, as if acquiring a certain agency, becomes almost a hand, and the nose hair pushed away the present towards him. And then the, the screen, uh, the, on the next uh, image, we see him, you know, standing from here. So this is the first time we actually see who this person is. And he's standing there, and he takes out the gift, the present from that wrapped, nicely wrapped package, and it's a razor. So he's standing there, and he's like, you know, getting rid of the nose hair that's starting to like sprouting from his face. And then um, he says, no, not me. And then he goes to the window and then you see the open, the window like curtain blinds open up. And he says, I'd rather um, breathe painfully than adapt numbly. So he's like trying to um, show that it's important to um, remember our humanness because he said that's the only way I can remember that the sky used to be blue so that's how the story ends and I, I thought that was in that sense like a really interesting video on of, of envisioning what air clips look like and also the you know the, the sprouting the nose hair it, because it changes the sense of what humanness is and I think this video really plays with that um, yeah so it shows how humans could potentially adapt to a highly polluted uh, air, but at the same time, it's this transformation of the human. And in some ways, as you say, you know, like it, one could choose to remain human and suffer or adapt and then lose one's humanity or become another kind of being. So it's not a human as we knew it. Um, and that would be a form of extinction, right? As, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, extinction um, is the end of something, but the beginning of something else. And so those humans who have adapted and grown <laughs> that very long nose hair, um, they are a different kind of human, no longer human as we know humans nowadays, right? Um, so, so that really leads us to, to the third um, theme that we wanted to discuss, um, which is that of extinction. So when we ask sustainability for whom um, and, and what sustainability means, what it is we're aiming for, um, one of the things we are aiming for, I think, is, is the, 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 the continuity of humans as we know them, and the continuity of, the, of, of those ecosystem services. We want the services to continue to be provided to us. And, um, and so we're, we're trying to maintain um, things as they are, but, um, but extinction is happening as, as we are pushing for this. And, uh, and so there's a necessity for us to, to really think um, about uh, extinction. And, um, and I, I think one of the things I've been thinking about a lot for the last year is, is how the current pandemic um, has really confronted us um, with um, our own vulnerability and our own mortality in a way that, um, that, that might be pretty new for us, or at least new for um, the so-called uh, developed world, right? Um, in, in Canada, uh, for me, um, you know, the idea of epidemics and, and deadly diseases and zoonotic diseases, diseases that come from animals, that's something very foreign. It doesn't happen in Canada, or at least that's what we like to think. But um, And so the pandemic and, and how it unfolded, how it became global, 
um, rendered some humans vulnerable or, or, or taught those humans that they were vulnerable all along, they just didn't realize it, right? Um, we need to keep in mind that for many humans on the planet, this vulnerability has been a daily affair for a long time. Many populations lived um, in, in dismal conditions and are faced with their vulnerability and their mortality on a daily basis. So, so this is really a phenomenon that, uh, for, uh, for certain, a certain chunk of the human population. Um, so the, the, you know, there's the Anthropocene on the one hand, oh, look, we've done this. And then, oh, we, we are now faced with, um, with our own vulnerability and mortality. So we're vulnerable because of what we did to the environment, but we're also vulnerable because we might be faced with diseases like this. What's interesting, of course, uh, with this pandemic is that it is a zoonotic disease, COVID-19 is. Um, and, um, and so... This, again, is connected to the environmental crisis because um, zoonotic diseases are made more and more possible because of the multiplied contacts we have with uh, non-human animals and, and how we continue to, um, to take more space and, and get closer to um, non-human animals. Also, how we raise them and the conditions in which we raise them for our consumption, again, a human-centric perspective, right? Um, and, um, and how sometimes we get in, in touch with exotic animals. Um, you know, we're not talking about cats and dogs, but pangolins and, and bats. And, you, and there was this video that went viral in, in the time of a virus <laughs> um, last uh, summer, early summer or spring, um, about... Um, when people were trying to identify the origin of the, of the pandemic and, and, and there was this video about someone eating a bat soup, right? And, and Shin, you want to tell me about that video and how, because it, it served to uh, feed into a certain um, horrible racist trope about um, the pandemic, but, but you told me something that I didn't know about this video, so. Right, yes. So, um... The video was um, actually originally shot or filmed in 2016 for a travel show filmed in Palau uh, in the uh, archipelago in Western Pacific Ocean. So, um, but the video was then kind of like as if it was providing evidence for, you know, this primitive way of consuming animals that the Chinese people do uh, and in conjunction with imageries of the wet market, you know, like how dirty uh, your eating habit is and how dirty. And I think that was really interesting because there were a lot of fake news um, about um, animals uh, during that time, but they traveled very quick. And I think there was a very interesting sense of, uh, on the one hand, the sense of, you know, uh, human and um, non-human uh, species, like the kind of intimacy. And at the same time, the sense of, um, fear, the sense of, uh, you know, the possibility of contagion, the possibility of contamination. But I, I find what is, re I, as you mentioned, the, the aspect of race that I find that really interesting because even in the, in the video, like, you know, in the nose hair video that we were talking about, for me, there was a very interesting racial element there and how humanness is understood. And I, I Joan K. Anderson's work, for example, that it notes that the human or the figure of man as you know white masculine is supposedly um, emerge uh, out from nature from both within and without. So nature from without is considered as you know through agriculture, through different form of cultivation versus nature within is considered as a form of animality, the wilderness that must be tamed. So in the sense that the nose hair is becoming you know like it, it become it acquires an agency but as the wilderness inside, and therefore changes what is considered as human, who is always in control, who can, you know, cut the border, who can, um, in, in a sense, become civilized and the pure, in a sense of um, a, a manner that can manage the, the wilderness from inside. And I think here, in the sense of what was happening, the narrative of COVID-19, especially at the beginning, you know, when 
because typically people think of outbreaks or you know this different kind of virus outbreaks are always happening in regions that is considered what is global south because of you know the living condition and the way of living with animals and consumption and so on it should never happen in a, what is considered global north and there was in my opinion um, an exacerbated sense of the um, other um, who does not, you know, um, live peacefully with animals and who is uh, exacerbating the condition of, of um, uh, uh, like ecological crisis in relation to, you know, the, what was happening in the pandemic. I think all of this racialization or racialized narratives are very important to also like think through and engage with uh, in the discussions we have about, you know, sense of humanity or the sense of the vulnerability of the human we, because there's always the question of what's the difference and that matters. Yeah, and, and I think the, the vulnerability, I mean, yes, I, I'm glad you bring this up because it's, it's not just individual vulnerability, but it's a global vulnerability, right? So if certain populations are vulnerable, then then I too am vulnerable. So vulnerability is not localized, right? It may be experienced as such in various degrees and, and, and according to location, but eventually it is a global phenomenon. And I think the pandemic has taught us that. I mean, we don't want to talk too much about the pandemic. Everybody's going through it. We're all tired of it. But, um, but, but we felt that it was important to bring that up because um, again, it's this moment of crisis, and it's it's this moment again a, a, a possibility of coming to a reckoning um, that yes, um, we are all vulnerable, we are all faced with our mortality, and it, it reminds us that we too, as a species, might go extinct. Right. Um, that we we might end up uh, being wiped out if not by this virus maybe by another right and and so we need again to rethink the our actions and how it has led us to um that that possibility right um and and what's interesting when we think about extinction you know the potentiality of our own extinction um we need to think about other mass um, events, mass extinction events, right? Um, and so right now, scientists are saying we are living through the sixth mass extinction. There have been five previous ones um, and, and some pretty severe. One of them saw only about 5% of living species um, survive the event. So that was quite extensive. It almost wiped out uh, all life from Earth. And... Um, but what's interesting when we think about that and going back to the, the notion of Wei Ji is that these extinction events um, actually were generative because they created the conditions for our species and others um, to emerge. So, uh, again, this idea that, well, you know, extinction may not be all that bad, could be bad for whomever is going extinct human or other, um, but in itself, it can be generative and can lead to, um, to other instances of life thriving. Um, of course, what's different with this current um, mass extinction event is that it is, it is caused by humans, right? So it's, it's, it's unfolding at the same time as the Anthropocene is unfolding. And I use the term unfolding um, because I was reading um, Tom Van Doren on, um, on his work on, on extinction. And one thing that is really important that he, that he brings up is the idea that um, we think of extinction events and the notion of event um, seems to indicate that there's a moment in time uh, when it happens, a precise moment. Um, so when the last individual of a species um, dies, this is where you have a species extinction. And he brings up the, um, the example of Martha, um, the passenger pigeon, who died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. And, um, and he says, yes, so there were witnesses to Martha's passing. Um, so the last individual of the species passenger pigeon died that day. However, the species itself was already dead and had been for a long time. Because a species is not just a group of individuals. It's a way of life, 
right? And that goes back to to the the people of small, right? With the with the nose hair, their way of life is so different than our way of life that they can be said to be a different species, right? That we may be said to have become extinct if we have changed so radically. Um, and so that's a point that, that Van Doren makes um, quite forcefully is to say, extinction actually is a dull, long unfolding event. It takes time and it unfolds as individuals of a species no longer um, have the opportunity to engage in their life in the way that species has always done. And so, when you have a group of individuals in a national pres uh, preservation site, or if you have a group of individuals in a zoo, um, you might be preserving individuals, but they are not experiencing their species way of life. They're not experiencing their relations with other species, which is part of their ways of, li of living. And so, um, the other part of that, too, what, what that makes me think about is that, well, because we share this world with these species um, and because their ways of living are now radically altered and they're, they've started their own extinction, that means that being connected to them, either closely or not so closely, our own ways of living are being affected. And so therefore our own extinction is um, probably already on the go. It, it has started to unfold because we're connected with all of these other beings and other species with whom we share the world. So yes, the, the disappearance of those species or, or, or the fact that their disappearance has started is also um, triggering our own extinction as the human species, the way in which we're living. And, and, and again, to go back to um, the, the many environmental crises, um, many humans, one could say all humans, but, but many humans are, are really experiencing in a quite severe manner alterations to their ways of living because of all kinds of climate events and, and climate emergencies. And, and so, yes, climate change is a thing that affects everyone, but some humans are, are much more deeply impacted than others. And so, yes, that extinction, the alteration of our way of life has already started and is continuing to unfold. Um, what, what do you think of that, Shin? Yeah, I completely agree, and I, I think um, one thing that I want to mention, at, perhaps at the end, is that uh, coming back to the notion of responsibility, because what is really um, important in that term, at least in Haraway's formation uh, formulation for me, is that it's changing from shifting the notion from the sense that you know the individual being responsible, so the individual has a certain sense of capacity and agency. Uh, to be responsible and accountable for something to a sense of uh, relationality where, you know, Harry says responsibility is only possible if you have multi-direction relations. So in a sense, it's not that, you know, the individual or someone who, for example, the exceptional a human is able to respond to the environment, but it's that it's only because there is this radical differences, there is this multiplicity of differences of different relations enables us to respond. So there's a sense of responsibility. And I, I really like that because I think ultimately um, what is at core, and I think also perhaps uh, in terms of our conversation today is that the, the need for thinking in uh, a dynamic relational terms, thinking through multiplicity um, without reducing it to a certain sense of you know this exceptional, um, undifferentiated way is one a very important both political and ethical gesture to think through the Anthropocene. Yes, I, I that that's a perfect wrap up. I think <laughs> to what to what we were discussing, and 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 this is certainly um, how we saw these various pieces um, articulating together, right? Um, and. Uh, yeah, so, so we're, we're trying to disentangle uh, through our conversation um, 
things that in fact cannot be disentangled, right? It, it, these, these problems and, and, and beings, they're, they're all intermingled. And, and so we, we need to do a better job at, at, at conceptualizing this and, and, and really coming to an understanding of these various multiple entanglements, right? Um, so yes, um, we think we must come to a re reckoning of the extent and, and the severity of the crises um, that we are living through, but also rethink our response, right? Like really be response able um, and, and engage in that uh, response ability. Um, yeah, well, that's great. Um, I think we've talked for long enough. Um, so um, again, if um, our audience um, has questions or comments, um, direct them to the Facebook page for the event. And Kaisa has now joined us. And um, I'm going to turn it to her to see if uh, she already has something for us. Kaisa. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks, uh, Christine and Shin. Um, so I've been looking at our question section and currently we don't yet have any uh, questions from the audience, but we will, I suggest we give them some time to type <laughs> and post their questions if there will be any. Uh, but maybe in the meantime, I can pose a question. Uh, I thought when you, Christine, uh, were talking about extinction as that how one could uh, imagine it as a punctual event at the last uh, last member of some species dies, but then it actually is a much longer, longer process. I was thinking about this this whole question of temporality because uh, I this comes from my background as a uh, literary scholar. There's a lot of artists uh, talking about this, like how can you make art and let's say narratives uh, f uh, where people can somehow imagine this temporality uh, of extinction or of uh, Anthropocene or of different kinds of uh, environmental like issues um, and climate change being one. Uh, so do you have any ideas of how can we help, like how, how can hu hu people kind of, what would help us to imagine these things that are kind of that go beyond the, let's say the experiential frame of a human being or like a biographical frame or general like this usual frame in which people think about experience and history yeah thank you um actually um i have been reading a lot on extinction recently and th there's a case um that is being made in that literature for the um the necessity to tell stories um, and, and this is where, of course, um, artists and, and creative writers um, um, have a role to play, a very important role, where they can um, bring, uh, this is going to sound weird, but bring to life the end of the life of a species, right? Um, so they, they, they can, in telling the story of a species and, and how its environment is altered and what it means in terms of its thriving and how, um, what kind of challenges it brings up to, for that species and for other species revolving around that one species, by, by telling those stories either in words, um, through creative writing, poetry, uh, fiction, or um, with the help of artworks, um, um, visual art um, uh, of all kinds, um, you, you, you can then at least generate an image um, for, for whoever gets exposed to these artworks and, and creative works and, and generate a sense of what it would be like um, to experience the world from that species perspective, right? Of course, in some ways, we're always stuck in our own perspective as humans, um, but, but through these evocative ways and telling the stories, um, we can perhaps achieve that. Tom Van Doren's book, Flight Ways, um, which is a bat extinction, tells the stories of um, different species of birds um, that went into extinct and how that unfolded. And, and this is a way to draw attention to the phenomenon and, and, and make a reader think of what it would be like to be that bird, that member of a species and go extinct. But Shin, did you want to add to this? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if this is the, um, the good answer for this question, but I was just thinking about the, uh, I, there were two documentary films that I found. One of them is about the seed bank. So it's in a way of already imagining that we are already, you know, <laughs> dead. Uh, and, the, you know, the like the ecological, or at least, you know, the ecological process has gone to such an extent that the extent that a lot of species, including plants, seeds, like they're already gone extinct. So the air seed bank uh, in the northern part of Norway, I forgot the um, city's name now suddenly, um, is to preserve as many seeds as possible from all over the world. So in a sense, it's, I think, realizing the extinction uh, through, you know, preserving the seeds. Another thing I thought, uh, which was really interesting, is the uh, nuclear waste site in Finland that has been constructing, and the idea is that it's going to be able to, you know, uh, keep the nuclear waste safe uh, for as long as up to like hundreds of years or a hundred year, for example, years. And one of the interesting part of the documentary was they were trying to think about what kind of language or what kind of sign they should have outside the nuclear waste sites to warn, uh, you know, they imagine that, okay, humans already would be dead then. So they want to warn like, you know, the uh, a reindeer or some kind of non-humans that this is this site, please don't approach it. Please don't go near it, please don't dig because it will still be very dangerous. And the idea was like, what kind of language will be used post the death of human to warn other species? And I thought that was also a very interesting um, you know, ways of thinking about extinction, per perhaps not in the exact same way uh, in terms of like artistic approach, but this is one way of perhaps realizing extinction that we're already living through. Um, yeah, I, I there are different ways of, of doing that, of evocating, and, and also like, uh, you know, some people will say, well, there's a lot of extinction porn, right? Um, and, and there is, I mean, there's a lot of narratives about um, the human extinction or humans on the verge of extinction or the world after humans. It, it's very easy. Anybody who Googles world after human, um, there's there's tons of images um, of, of nature reclaiming human sites and 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 what the world would be like if we were to disappear. And again, that that's another way to um, try to imagine what that might be and what might come out of this extinction event if we were to go extinct. Um, Alan Wiseman's uh, popular book, uh, The World Without Us. Um, is is that kind of book where it's like, okay, what would happen to Manhattan, for example, if humans were to disappear tomorrow morning, all of them gone? Um, what's going to happen to the island? How will it be reclaimed? The buildings, how will they crumble? The subway system, all of that, right? The water, how the water will reclaim um, the, 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 the soil of the island itself. So um, these are all ways, I think, that 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 can make uh, readers or audiences um, think about extinction and, and then ask themselves, okay, again, it's a moment of reckoning. So this these um, these various extinctions are possible. They are unfolding or have unfolded. So how do we want to move forward now? And do we want to move forward in a way that limits? Um, the, the, the extent of extinctions, but also um, keeping in mind that extinction is also generative. Um, and so life will continue to thrive even when we're gone, right? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot um, for both of you. Uh, we don't have questions now, so I think I suggest that uh, we end here and I want to mention that this uh, recording will be available online on the Think Corner page and also later on the Helsinki Collegium YouTube channel. So and can... another reminder um, is that in two weeks from today, so on April 15th, um, the second um, Collegium talks uh, with Eki Petamaki and Magnus Heiner. So um, the information is on the, web, uh, the Facebook um, page and also the Think Corner webpage um, for that next talk. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Shin. That was a great conversation. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. And thanks, Kaisa, for uh, doing the moderating. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>